Good afternoon. It is, first of all, lovely to have you all here. Um, thank you for being here. I want to welcome everybody who is joining us online. Um, and I want to thank uh, Radiant and Pastor Lee for uh, giving me this opportunity to spend a bit of time uh, with you this afternoon. What an incredible day and a half it's already been. And um, uh, I hope that the next hour will, um, that you'll be able to take something um, from what I've got uh, to share with you today. So I'm here with uh, Ruth. This is my wife um, over here. Um, she's my superstar. I knew I, had, I, knew I was going to have one person in the room. Um, so, um, but I'm blessed uh, to have so many of you here. So thank you. Uh, and we live, uh, we've been in the U.S. Uh, for 10 years, um, as you can tell, hopefully from my accent. Um, I'm originally from the U.K. And I say hopefully because Ruth tells me that my accent is slowly slipping. So I'm going to try and hold on to it um, as best I possibly can. So today we are going to be talking about ideas. We're going to be talking about innovation and, and creativity. And I I had to kind of think back to why, like, why am I so passionate about this, this topic? Why do I believe ideas can really drive change? And I remember uh, in what I think most of you would call middle school. So I was, I guess I was 12 or 13, and I had a teacher called Mr. Parry. And every day he would read a, a book, a, a, an excerpt from a book, and it was called Ideas That Change the World. And I think it was just like drummed into me from that, uh, from that, at that point in time that ideas really can change, uh, change the world. They can change our behaviors. They can change, um, they can change everything. And I think from that early stage, I got passionate about ideas. And that's really what I've spent most of my um, uh, career over probably the last 20 or it's probably 25 years now, but I'm still, let's go with 20 because uh, that um, makes me feel uh, younger. So um, can we just pray before we get, uh, get started? Does that sound good? <sighs> Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity um, to spend this time with this group here and everybody who's joining online. I just pray, Lord, that, that whatever is the message that you have um, for this group today, I pray that you would bring me the words, bring me the wisdom and the knowledge. Uh, Lord, just have your way um, in this next hour, Lord. I pray it's a, um, it brings hope and inspiration and some excitement for what lies ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, my plan for the next roughly 40 minutes, something like that, um, is um, I'm going to talk to you uh, or share with you a few things that I've learned in my secular life related to ideas and innovation and creativity. And then I want to make the connection uh, to what that means for us as Christians and, and how should we be approaching this whole area uh, and I think, um, spoiler alert, I think we are uniquely placed to be incredible innovators uh, and full of ideas and innovation. So um, I, I'm actually going to approach this in three parts. And Miguel, I, I, I'm normally used to presenting with a clicker. So Miguel is going to be my clicker today. And Miguel, maybe you can just move on to the next slide, um, please. So I want to start by talking about mindset. So it's going to probably be a bit weird because I'm not going to talk about ideas until a little, a little way into this conversation. But the first thing I want to talk about is mindset because I believe that our mindset is one of, if not the most important thing in determining whether we create an environment where ideas can thrive, where ideas can be successful. Um, let's just go to the next slide, Miguel, please. I, this is um, what I feel like most of the meetings that I attend can often feel like. Um, it, the, I've often heard finance committee described as the place where good ideas go to die, um, right? If this is our world, if this is our environment, this is what it feels like, um, then it's no surprise that we don't uh, see the raft of creativity and innovation. Things get stifled. So, you know, as you think about that, um, we've got to be really, really intentional about mindset. We've got to think about where we are in the process. And one of the things that I really encourage you to do um, you know, there's a time for being full of creativity and full of innovation and full of possibility. And then there's a time for closing things down and starting to say, okay, what are we going to do? We've got to be really clear to everybody which mode we're in. Uh, because if you have half the group who are in the closing things down and half the group are in the possibility, imagine what could be. Uh, funnily enough, things aren't going to work and you're going to end up with things colliding. So it's really, really important to signal uh, to everyone, where are we at on our journey uh, right now? And Here's a phrase, if you can go to the next slide, that I love to use, um, and it's called, I heard it, and I just latched onto it, it's called, wow before the how. And um, I'm sure you've probably all been there where everybody's like, well, you know, we kind of, um, 
we tried that last year, and you know it didn't work because of X, Y, and Z. And you know, well, we thought about doing that, but yeah, what you need to know about what this group right here is, what's different is, and you hear all of these things straight away. So my encouragement is, before we get into judging, before we start to think about the practicalities and so on and how we might make it happen, start with the wow. So when you hear somebody and they have a, a gem of an idea or a thought, just let it grow, let it breathe for a moment. Um, and, and this is such a simple thought, and I, as anybody who knows me knows, I love simplicity and I love making it really, really easy. Um, so hold on to that thought about um, the, the wow uh, before the how. Um, you know, the other things that you can do is ask some really provocative questions, like what's the one thing that if we could do it differently, if it could be different, would change everything? Ask yourself those really bold questions, those things that kind of scare us a little bit, because those are going to be the things that are going to open up um, possibilities. And I, I wanted to say one word on failure. Um, you know, the only failure is failing to learn from failure, right? Um, we have to fail. We have to fail. I'm going to share with you some of the examples of the things that have, um, where, where I've seen success and where we've had incredible uh, results. But I can tell you that behind all of those, there's a litany of things that were disasters that didn't work. Uh, and frankly, most of what I'm sharing with you today comes from that journey and those experiences of things not uh, actually working. So I, I wanted to give you one example, and um, uh, so this is an example. I've worked for Kellogg's cereal company for about 18 years, nearly, um, in the UK and um, in the US and around the world. And, um, uh, you know, cereal, um, everybody's seen it, everybody's eaten it forever. Um, it's advertised as cereal uh, with milk in a bowl, probably with four people sat around a table, and that's been pretty much it forever probably 100 years since WK, um, just up the road, kind of came up with the idea. And, you know, the problem was cereal's really, really boring. Um, and we needed to do something about it. So somebody had a great idea on the team. They were like, hey, you know, we should think about cereal like pasta. Uh, or pasta, what do you say? Pasta. pasta. Thank you. That was English there. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stick with pasta. Um, you should think about it like pasta because you could eat it anyway. You could eat it with ice cream. You could eat it, um, I mean, you could pour on syrup. You can put nuts on it. You can eat it in the middle of the night. You can do, you can do all these things with it. Why didn't we think about that before? So it was a really good idea. Um, and the mindset of the team was very um, open to what's possible. And I say that because we briefed a classic advertising agency and they came back and they said, okay, we've got this great idea. You know, we're going to picture the scene as you kind of, kind of, anybody who's seen the kind of classic movies or Mad Men or something like that, you know, these guys come in and they say, okay, we're going to do a 30-second TV ad and somebody comes into somebody's home and they're going to reimagine it. And, and we were all sat there and completely underwhelmed because uh, it just didn't do justice to, um, to this idea. And we said, and then there was a guy on uh, my team who came to me and he said, I, I think I've got another idea. And he said, I, I think we should open a restaurant. And... Um, like, this is a company that's made cereal for 100 years, sells to Walmart, you know, deals with big trucks, doesn't deal with, like, restaurants. And, um, but, but if you think about the wow before the how, the, the best thing to say, okay, tell me more, tell me more about it. It's like, well, I think we could sell cereal in every kind imaginable from the middle of the, you know, uh, early morning all the way through to the evening. I think we could just do it completely differently. I was like, tell me more. Okay, well, we'll get, we'll get a celebrity chef. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And we ended up launching um, the cafe in Times Square in New York. And it was um, more, six times more successful than any traditional advertising that we'd done previously. Um, and people read about it in social media. We got to open the New York Stock Exchange as a result. Um, all of that to say, it's a secular example, but it's an example of, you know, if the classic mindset would have been, um, oh, no. Um, no, we don't. That's not what we do around here. That's not the way we do it. So I just encourage you just to be open to the fact that the ideas might look really, really different um, to what we do today. So if you think about that, let's um, go on to this next slide. I want us to think also about individuals because we all come at things with um, our own perspective, right? We all come with our own mindset. And one thing I want to say up front, there's, I love things like MBTI and Enneagram and all these different typology things that you can do. And some people love them, some people hate them, but it kind of helps you to think about um, your preferences. And I think one of the things I want to say up front is so important is that those, you have to be really careful to make sure they don't define you. Those things are just a guide for where you might you, you tend to gravitate. Um, 
But I want to share one that I heard this in the last year because I thought it was really, really useful. So um, it's from the table group. And they, I like it because it's all about geniuses. And that sounds really good to me. I think everybody, basically means everybody's a genius. Um, and there's six geniuses. And I wonder as we go through these, generally what, what they'll say is there's two that you just naturally go to. You're like absolutely draw energy out of it. And then there's two that you can do, but they're really, really hard work. And uh, maybe at the end I'll ask Ruth if she can tell me which. I think Ruth's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure you'll know which ones uh, I struggle with. But anyway, um, the six geniuses here, um, there's the genius of wonder. So these are the people that look at the world and imagine it different. They just, they ask the questions, why? And why is it like that? And why is it, and, and what if? Um, that's the, the gift of wonder. The second is the gift of innovation. So these are the people that just walk around and go, hey, I've got an idea. I've got an idea for you. I've got an idea for you. They're exhausting, but I've got an idea for you. I've got an idea for you. Um, the third is the gift of discernment. So um, this is that ability to actually look at an idea and say, yeah, actually, the, the, what we need to think about with that or what would have to be true for that is this thing. They're really good at kind of assessing an idea and working out whether it's going to work. The fourth is the galvanizers. These are people who, um, they're really good at getting a group together and exciting people, um, getting people unified behind an idea and, and, um, and corralling effort. Um, the fifth are the enablers. These are the people that bring, bring the help. So these are the people that see the, the financial need, the people need. They can, they're like, okay, yes, absolutely, I can help with that. I love the idea. I'm here. This is, um, we're, let's go make it happen. And then the sixth one, which is not me, is um, the people that actually make sure it gets done and gets across the finish line. And these people are really, really important. They are going to drag it kicking and screaming across the line to get that thing done. Um, and I say that because, you know, I talked about the fact we've got to be really intentional about our mindset and wh where are we on our journey when it comes to ideas and innovation. Also think about it from an individual level. Where am I naturally going to gravitate towards? Um, I won't ask everybody to put their hands up today, but hopefully you can kind of connect and start to feel with where you might be. So it's really, really good just to be able to think, okay, where am, where am I at as I come into this uh, conversation about ideas and creativity? Okay, you, uh, you can go to the, uh, to the next slide. I actually... Um, so we've talked about groups and we've talked about, um, we've talked about us as individuals. I want to talk about us as Christians and our Christian mindset. And we've all heard this verse countless times, but it, I feel like this one just never gets old. Um, it says, and we're in Ephesians uh, 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Um, abundantly more. Um, we have a God who, I, I like to think of him as, um, he's kind of like mission impossible. Uh, the things that we think are impossible, that we just see no way for them to happen, he just does it. And, I, and you see it, if you, as you know, you spend time in the Word, you just see it over and over again. I read, um, I was reading Acts this week, and I was reading just the, the conversion of, of Paul. And, you know, you see Saul stood over as the executioner. There is no way out for this guy, right? I mean, it's impossible. And, that, and yet, in the very next chapter, we hear how um, Paul, or Saul, is, is God's chosen instrument. I'm like, it, it, you know, it just kind of blows your mind. So think about that. Think about all of those stories, um, all of those things that are real, uh, where the impossible happened. You know, I think our mindset as Christians, we should be the most possibility-oriented group of people on the face of the planet. I really, really um, believe that. Um, somebody who um, is really good, if you want to read in this area, Mark Batterson, um, I've got a couple of quotes from him that I just love. Um, the first of, is this one. Miguel, if you can bring it up. Um, this is a great question uh, for all of us. Uh, to ask, what looms larger in our mind, memories or possibilities? And don't get me wrong, there's power in memories. And we talked this morning about, you know, remembering the great revivals and the things that we're going to draw inspiration from. But if, if the past is where we spend our time, we will never spend our time in the future and what's possible. Um, so I, I, this, to me, is a, really, um, is a really, really challenging question to ask ourselves you know, where am I today? Where am I dwelling? And, you know, sometimes when I feel like I'm, um, I'm not being as creative, I'm not um, being as innovative as I need to be, 
it's nearly always because I'm dwelling in the past and I'm thinking about mistakes or I'm thinking about things, that, maybe things that went right and I'm trying to hang on to that way that it went right and it's like, actually, I'm going to go do a new thing. Um, so I just, um, I, I love that one. And then um, I wanted to, to finish this section, this first piece, with the second quote, if you can go there, Miguel. Um, the size of your dreams may be the most accurate measure of the size of your God. Um, and I, I just, I read that and I loved it and I underlined it and I highlighted it. And, um, you know, um, when was the last time we tried to do something that was not going to happen without divine intervention? You know, leaving room for God to be able to move, to show up and move in our life. And I'm somebody, I like to control things. I like to know that there's a plan. I, you know, I like things worked out. Um, even this workshop, I'm like, I want everything worked out. And, and it, I mean, it wasn't. Um, but I'm really trying to give room in my life for God to show up and God to move. Um, so um, that's really what I wanted to say about mindset. Mindset's so, so important. And if you take nothing else out, think about ideas and innovation and creativity by getting in the right mindset first and remembering that as Christians, we can be the most uh, possibility-oriented people. Okay, the second thing I wanted to talk about uh, was purpose. Um, so um, purpose is obviously really, really important. And if, you, if you're not clear, whether you're talking about a school or a church or a business or wherever you are, if you don't understand why you're there, innovation becomes really, really, really hard um, because it just becomes random. Um, and um, I like a, a quote here from uh, Simon uh, Sinek, who's a um, you probably you may have heard of him. He's a leadership author and, and so on and speaker that's out there. And he says, uh, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, and I think that's also really true if you think about the organizations and the teams you're a part of. You want to connect them to the why uh, behind uh, why you're there because then they're going to bring their heart and soul um, to, uh, to what's in hand. So I think it's really, really important that we understand why uh, we're here. Um, there's um, another author that I really like, um, Michael Cooley, and he says, this might be a little bit harsh, but um, it's nice and simple. Every activity not aligned with your purpose is a waste of resources. Um, it's, pretty, it's a pretty challenging statement, but I think it's a really good filter for us to say, okay, if, if we're really about this, is everything that we're doing organized and driving towards that thing? Because if it isn't, then we end up with random stuff. And I guess every once in a while, one of those random things hits. Um, but we've really got to understand um, where we're coming from. And um, if I think about innovation and ideas and creativity and things that I've been involved in, where we've often gone off track is because we are not really know why on earth we're, we're doing this thing in the first place. So I'm going to give you an example. So we're going to go back to um, the world of Kellogg's. And uh, how many people um, have eaten a Rice Krispie treat? Okay, most, most people. Um, I didn't really know what they were when we moved here. Um, and we did like Rice Krispie cakes, I think. But um, Rice Krispie treats, they are, they are the thing that brings the family together, right? You bake these slabs and, um, and then you kind of, you cover it with all this stuff. And um, so I worked, that, was, that was one of the brands that I, um, I worked on at, at Kellogg. And one of the things about that brand, in terms of what it stood for, was it was all about human connection. It was all about bringing people together. And that made sense to me once I understood the history of Rice Krispie treats and where this thing came from. Like you open it up and everybody comes uh, in and gets excited about it. So... Um, the purpose of that brand was all about human connection. And um, uh, back to school. Back to school is a really big time um, for retailers. It's a really big time for people that make all this kind of stuff. And kids go back to school. And somebody on my team said, you know, the most important um, school supply is love and support. And I was like, oh, that's good. Somebody write that down before we, we forget it. Love and support is the most important back to school supply. And, and so that led to the idea to put right on wrappers um, on the uh, on the wrapper because what parents were saying is, hey, I send my kids off to school and then I'm not there, and I wish I could just send them an encouragement in the middle of the in the middle of the day, which was really cool, did very well. But if you think about the purpose of this brand and, and human connection, um, uh, somebody else came and said, hey, we've got visually impaired kids that can't that for this they, it doesn't work for them, like they can't receive um, those messages, and I and I was like, I felt like I'm back in the um, cereal cafe thing. I'm like, okay, tell me more. Uh, what are you thinking? And they're like, well, I think we could do Braille 
um, stickers that parents could order um, that's customized to what the message they want to send to their kid, we can send them to them and then we can put them uh, on there and, 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 that's what, and that's what we could do. I was like, that sounds pretty cool. How do we do it? No idea. Um, but that doesn't matter yet because we're still in the wow phase. And, uh, and they did it. And you know what I love is as they got into it, they were like, do you know there's actually a significant number of visually impaired kids can't actually read Braille, so we need to do an audio version. And, and it just kept going and going and going. And again, what's fascinating about it is in terms of, A, it was the right thing to do, but from an impact standpoint um, on the business was also incredibly effective, much more effective than all the other stuff we'd traditionally done. And why is it effective? I believe it's because it comes back to the purpose and why, um, why the brand exists in the first place. So, um, I, by the way, I think in life I never thought I would talk about Rice Krispie Treats and Jesus. <laughs> and so uh, I feel like God's kind of laughing, and he's like, yeah, I, I got this, like, I'm going to bring it all together. So um, I want to talk about purpose as, as Christians. And um, I think we are blessed to have the clearest or the most clarity on purpose, again, on anybody on the face of the earth, right? Everybody knows. Let's go to the, let's go to the Great Commission in, in Matthew. Um, so I love this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Um, and by the way, just as an aside, I, I love that it says, and behold, I am with you. <laughs> always to the end of the age, so we're certainly not doing this alone. Um, but I, um, I just love the clarity in that. It's just abundantly clear what we are supposed to be focusing our energy and our time and our resources on. Um, and, and this is something that I think um, many of us uh, struggle with. You know, what's the point? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? Find the connection back to this, because that's where we find our purpose. Um, I, uh, uh, <laughs> this is a, a lovely quote that, um, that I wrote down. It said, God is in the business of strategically positioning us in the right place at the right time. Of course, it seems like the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> and I, I feel like that happens a lot, but God really does position us in the right place um, to be able uh, to move. And I, I don't know if I, if I kept in the next slide. Miguel, if you can go there. Um, I, I love this quote. It's another one from Simon Sinek. It says, dream big, start small, but most of all, start. Um, and I think sometimes we get kind of paralyzed and like, oh, I don't know. Is it right? Is it right? Should I be doing this? Should I be not? Let's, let's start. Uh, let's take that step, because Jesus always comes and meets you when you start stepping. Um, so um, uh, that's, that's purpose. So um, as Christians, we have this, um, or we should have this mindset oriented towards what's possible. Um, we also have absolute clarity in our purpose and, and what we're here uh, to do. So let's then move on now, and uh, Miguel, maybe go to the next slide. We're going to start to talk about ideas themselves. Um, and... Uh, so we kind of need some ideas, right? Um, how do we actually uh, think about and come up with ideas? Um, there's, there's three steps that I like to use as I think about coming up with ideas. And what I want to say actually before I get to this is that there's no formula <laughs> for ideas. And I, I would say that I don't think I've ever come up with an idea when I've been sat in a room kind of like stood at a whiteboard, you know, waiting for something to happen. So you, you really um, need to be open to inspiration happening at any point. Um, it's actually really good. You know, if you read, there's a great book called Habit, which is um, an excellent read. And, you know, if, if you follow the same route to work every day, if you eat the same thing every day, if you do the same thing every day, you drive the same route, you do all those things day after day after day, no surprise that there's not much room for inspiration and creativity. Um, so deliberately disrupt yourself and you'll find yourself becoming more creative and having more thoughts and ideas. So with that being said, I want to give you kind of three filters that I think are really useful um, when it comes to innovation and, and ideas. The first is, Miguel, if you can go to the next slide. Look, we're like in tune now. We're like, we're, we're, I feel like we're, uh, we're humming. So the first thing, it starts with that purpose, right? So we know we've got, we've got the mindset, but it starts with the purpose. Why are we here? What is it that we are trying to do? So whether this is, whether we're talking about your business, whether we're talking about your school, whether we're talking about your family, whether we're talking about the church, um, it starts with why are we here? And then 
you really want to get super clear on what's the problem we're trying to solve. What is the thing that's the barrier or the obstacle to, that, um, to the purpose for which you exist? What's getting in the way? And as you think about those problems, it's really, really good to keep asking why. Well, why, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Keep asking the question why to try to get to really to the root cause of what's getting in the way and really think about behaviors. Like, okay, well, um, so people are showing up at church once, in every, once every four weeks on average. Why is that? Okay, let's really start to get on into that, start to unpack uh, that. So we have to have clarity on, on purpose, on problem. And then the third bit, which is where it gets really exciting, is the possibility. What's the thing that we could do? What's the spark? What's the thing that could overcome that problem to achieve the purpose that we're striving uh, to do? Um, and this is where it gets exciting because this is where we get to bring in things like technology. We get to think about um, new ways of doing things that we haven't imagined before. And I think, you know, the last 18 months has been a perfect example of that. We've been innovating by necessity at an incredible rate and finding new and different ways uh, to do things. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to say about technology, though, is technology is... Um, it, it can get really exciting, and you can get really lost really quickly. So, um, and I know because I have. Um, so I, I feel like for years, I was like, we've got to have an app. Everybody's got an app. We need an app. What's it going to do? I have no idea. Uh, we, we should have wearables, right? Wearable technology. Why? I don't know. But it would be really cool if we could. Um, and I think if we chase the technology, um, then we put that first. And that really doesn't work. So what's so important is to think about the technology as, as part of the possible, as part of the solution, but you've got to understand the purpose first and the problem that you're trying to overcome. And when you understand those things, then the technology really gives you, um, really helps make that idea uh, work. And I, um, I wanted to go back, this is an idea that I was involved in in 2000. Um, who got their first mobile phone? Mobile, 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 cell phone before uh, 2000, before 2000. Anybody have a mobile phone before 2000, cell phone before 2000? There's a few. Okay, so um, uh, back in 2000, I, I was living in London uh, and um, I was getting used to this thing called texting, uh, which, was, which was pretty cool, but you know, it didn't have predictive text like we have today. Do you, by the way, just as an aside, I remember listening to people, you know, delivering messages, and, the, and, and it would be like, oh, here he is on the old school stuff and what it used to be like, and now I'm up here doing it. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, where was I? Yeah, so we're just getting used to texting. So we're typing in things like, um, how are you, with a capital R and a, and a U, because it takes too long to be able, you didn't have predictive text, you couldn't put the whole thing in. Um, but everybody was kind of obsessed with this idea of, of um, of uh, text messaging. And um, uh, at the time I worked for Cadbury, which is a chocolate company, um, the best chocolate in the world. And, um, uh, and everybody's heard of Willy Wonka, right? And the, the chocolate factory and the golden ticket. So like that, like we've been using that for like 80 years, basically just rolling over and over and find the lucky, the lucky bar. But it's, again, it's getting tired, it's getting bored. What are we about? We're about fun, we're about excitement and bringing brightness to your day. So, um, so somebody on the team came in and said, okay, I th I've got this idea. Um, uh, we wanna bring excitement, that's what we're all about. But the problem is everybody's seen it all before. We think that we might be able to put a text message inside of a chocolate bar wrapper and then get this, you could text that to a number and that number will text you back to tell you if you've won or not. And like, minds are blown. <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe now, but I remember in that moment, I, and, I, and I said, okay, do you know how to do it? Well, not quite, um, but we think we know some people that might be able to help us, um, help us do it. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is, this is what that looked like. It was called Cadbury Text and Win. And I, I had to go back to the BBC and look at what they said at the time. The biggest trial of wireless advertising. Uh, this promotion is pushing the boundaries of how text messaging can be used as a marketing tool. It was actually the first time that text messaging was used as a marketing tool. 10% of people in the UK uh, took part. And um, I, I think we probably agree it's subsequently become a pretty big thing uh, from a marketing standpoint. But 
what I wanted to use that as an example because it, it, you know, it came back to, okay, we're about bringing fun, we're about bringing excitement, that's what we're about, and there's this problem. It's just dull, it's just boring, we need to do something different, and it gave a purpose for the technology. Um, and uh, so I wanted to share that, and I, I, it's, it's wonderful. I look back on with quite a lot of nostalgia, I guess, um, related, to, um, related to that. So let's now think about it in relation to us as, as Christians. Um, and this is where I think it gets perhaps most exciting of all. Um, so uh, actually, I wanted to go to um, uh, 1 Corinthian, Corinthians 3.9. Um, and it says in uh, ESV, For we are God's fellow workers. Um, here's the King James Version. For we are laborers together with God. And I love that. Um, because it means that we are not operating under our own power. We are not operating on our own. when it And that means we're not operating on our own when it comes to ideas and innovation and creativity, um, which is pretty cool. We have something called the Holy Spirit. It's like this secret source. It's this extra special advantage that we have that's coming alongside us and is going to inspire us and is going to bring thoughts and is going to bring ideas and innovation if we are open to it. Um, uh, Mark Batterson references the movie um, Inception. If anybody's seen that movie, it's all about kind of implanting ideas into your subconscious. It's kind of a cool, uh, uh, a pretty cool movie. But one of the quotes that he says is, I believe the Holy Spirit performs Inception. Um, that idea of the Holy Spirit coming and planting something. And I feel like even over the last uh, day and a half, I've heard in multiple sessions people talking about how the Holy Spirit came and brought them this idea or brought them this thought or brought them, brought them this component that was going to really uh, set them on a course and set them on a trajectory. And if we're open to it, God is ready and willing to work with us. And that means in every, uh, in every facet. So... Um, uh, I guess as I, I kind of bring it um, uh, towards a close, you know, I believe there's I believe that there's ways of doing church that nobody's thought of yet. I think we've started to see that over the last 18 months. We've seen an acceleration in that. One of the things I love about the Great Commission, it's I, I also call it the Unconstrained Commission. Like it's it's it was very very clear, um, but it's also very open. Um, it's open to ideas, it's open to innovation, it's open to creativity. And I think we need to be able to approach it um, uh, in that way. So if you just go to the last slide, Miguel. Um, if I can leave you um, uh, with anything, it is that um, mindset really, really does matter as you're approaching the, the, the thoughts of innovation and creativity. And as Christians, we really should have the most possibility-oriented. We should be the most possibility-oriented people on the face of the earth. Secondly, from a purpose standpoint, we have absolute clarity as to why we're here and what we're supposed to do. So if nothing else, let's work on that uh, as a purpose. And then um, from an idea standpoint, remember that ideas can come from anywhere. Um, be really open to it, but be open to the Holy Spirit and be open to the Holy Spirit working in you and planting ideas in you and seeding those ideas in you. And when you hear an idea, remember, uh, wow, before the how. <laughs> um, so that's everything I had um, uh, for you guys. And I wonder, I can turn it open to any questions that you've got. I'm an open book, so um, feel free uh, to ask anything uh, that might be on your mind. Oh, um, actually, there's um, there are two. Um, uh, one of them is I want to say it's in a snowy pit, um, in a in a pit on a snowy day with a lion. That perfect dream team. Um, that is that's probably my um, that's probably my favorite. Um.